Hi, welcome to Glenohumeral Gurus, a podcast for clinicians with an interest in shoulder pathology. I'm your host, Margie Olds, it's a, and it's a pleasure for me to bring you these podcasts. The aim for the podcast is to deliver some clinically relevant content for you, and we aim to take around 15 to 20 minutes. I plan to interview people from all over the globe and talk to clinicians and researchers and anybody with an interest in shoulder pathology so that we can learn how to help these people better. So settle in and enjoy the podcast. Hey, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Professor Tim All to this podcast. Tim, it's a pleasure to have you on, on board and, and to discuss some all things scapula today. So welcome. Thank you. It's great to be on with you, Marty. Thanks for your time. So just to introduce Tim, Dr. All has been practicing physical therapy and athletic training since 1985 in various sports medicine settings. Tim received his bachelor's in health science from the University of Kentucky in physical therapy. After three years of clinical practice at the Lexington Sports Medicine Center, he went on to receive his master's degree in kinesiology from the University of Michigan. At Michigan, he worked with the athletic programs and at MedSports, their sports medicine outpatient center. He served both on the staff and as director of the outpatient physical therapy at the Human Performance and Rehabilitation Centers in Columbus, Georgia. He completed his doctorate in sports medicine at the University of Virginia in 1998, where he studied shoulder proprioception. Um, and I've really enjoyed your, uh, your PhD topic there, Tim, but I digress. And he is currently the professor in, in the Department of Physical Therapy at the University of Kentucky. Dr. All is an active member of the APTA, NATA, American Society of Shoulder and Elbow Therapists, uh, the ASSET Group, and the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeons, and as well the American Baseball Biomechanics Society. And just to add, Tim has been a fabulous mentor for me. Um, I was fortunate enough to spend a research fellowship with him in Kentucky in 2017, I think, so a few years ago now, but um, Tim, I'd just like to say what a fabulous mentor you have been, and I really appreciate your time. Um, it's been wonderful, and so today I wanted to talk specifically to you about scapulas. Um, the title of our podcast today is, when do you think the scapula is relevant in your assessment and diagnosis? Because it's a thing that plagues me in clinical practice. I wanted to start by asking how you got to be here. <laughs> how, how did you do, uh, where, when did you begin all this research that you've done on the scapula? And can you just describe your journey to here? Sure. Well, first, it's been a pleasure to work with you. You uh, have been a great uh, colleague and I've really enjoyed uh, our research efforts together. You are very good at stimulating thought. You're a very strong clinician and an outstanding researcher. So it's been a pleasure these last almost 10 years uh, coming yeah. up working together. So basically all things scapula sort of starts, doesn't end, but it certainly starts in Lexington, Kentucky with a guy named Ben Kibler. So it was my pleasure uh, to be his first physical therapist, athletic trainer, and really started sports medicine work. So I got hired by Dr. Kibler and the folks there because I was one of the first duly credentialed physical therapist, athletic trainers in Kentucky. And from that, his interest was everything sports. He was trying to build his practice and so he started getting interested in the scapula as we saw more shoulder pathologies. And so one of the first things that we did back in the 80s was a test called the lateral scapular slide. And the lateral scapular slide test was basically um, measuring the distance from the thoracic spine to the scapula in three different positions, arm at the side, arm abducted to 90 degrees and internally rotated. And he was under the concept, he knew something was messed up with the scapula when it was further displaced laterally from 
the uh, spine of the scapula. And so we started there um, and started treating uh, people with scapular dysfunction um, back in the 80s and, and incorporating that. So from, I graduated in 85, so in 86, I was treating scapulas as part of shoulder pain. So it's sort of in my DNA. But I think when it really caught on, so in 98, I came back to Lexington. I had finished my doctorate and I came back to work for Dr. Kibler in the Lexington Clinic. And he was still focusing on the shoulder and asset, the American Society of Shoulder and Elbow Therapists. I had gone to a couple of meetings, um, relatively new member, and I was charged by a really smart PhD by the name of Dorcas Beaton. And Dorcas was sort of our research chair, and she actually helped develop the DASH, which is world famous. And she charged me with the concept of, okay, how are you classifying this scapula dysfunction? And so I took it upon myself, and I met with Dr. Kibler, and he was coming up with these different um, scapula assessment techniques, married with Phil McClure and the folks out of Philadelphia who were looking at it biomechanically, and they identified three-dimensional motions of internal and up external rotation of the scapula, anterior and posterior tilt, and upward and downward rotation, looking at the three orthogonal rotations. So sort of them presenting that research in the late 90s, me finishing my PhD, getting to know Lori Mishner and Phil and those guys, we came up with the classification system known as the Kibler uh, type, four types of uh, scapular dyskinesis. So that's why I got involved with all of that. My influences from my dear friend, Ben Kibler, and, and basically started there um, and then continued to do research related to classification and assessment and, and exercise interventions. Thanks. It's a great synopsis. I've been, obviously, I've read all those papers, but it's really lovely to, to hear the background for them. I think um, it's been a really interesting journey, hasn't it? If we look now in 2024, back, you know, some 30-odd yeah. years, looking looking at how that has progressed. I, I guess what I particularly wanted to ask you is around the, today, is around the assessment of the scapula. Sure. Do you think that clinicians should be doing this for every shoulder patient that they see? When do you think it's relevant? What type of patients? What can you advise clinicians in, in that regard when to do the assessment before we actually drill into what that assessment looks like? Yep. So I think I think anybody with shoulder symptoms, the first thing that really has to be evaluated is the spine, the cervical and thoracic spine in association with referred pain. But anybody with shoulder pain um, that isn't coming from something cervical, we need to consider that the scapula is involved. And really the simplest thing to do is put them in an appropriate garment so you can see the shoulder blades move when they lift their arm. Now, we wanna maintain good face-to-face -face interaction with our patients, but really looking at them, lifting their arms overhead actively and passively, and that they have limited motion or pain with motions is an indication for me um, to see if I can sort of reposition the spine or the scapula. So I think Jeremy Lewis has sort of identified these modifications of the spine, the scapula, and the humerus. That sort of goes along with what Lynn Watson talks about, repositioning scapula. So I feel like, as I said, we've been looking at it since the 80s. I didn't know all those people. I wasn't as <laughs> knowledgeable about all of those people, even though they were out practicing. I've always looked at the scapula. And so it is part of my DNA, but anybody that has pain with active elevation and not subtle scapula dyskinesis, but obvious abnormal movement. Now we tried to classify it following the four dimension or three dimensions of scapular dyskinesis, and we had some success. 
the reliability was much better improved when McClure added weight. So having somebody yeah. lift with a load, we had them do it multiple repetitions. And Brady Tripp, one of my first doctoral students, well, my first doctoral student that I had, I was on other committees, actually went back and looked at some of our original data. And he said, you really can't separate it because it's abnormal movement in multiple planes. So Brady um, deserves a lot of credit. We were trying to classify and probably why we weren't very good in our reliability in the first Kibler classification paper is we made the the people that participated with us, we had physical therapists and physicians classifying into one of four categories. And that's really not how it works. And so if you just say, yes, there's something weird or scapula dyskinesis, abnormal movement pattern, and then something isn't weird, um, that's probably as succinct as we can be visually. If I see the weird moving scapula, medial border, inferior angle, excessive shrugging, if I can reposition that scapula, and this is where the scapula assistance and scapula retraction test, reposition test that Phil McClure uh, and Angela Tate talked about, basically that same concept that Jeremy Lewis says, see if you can change how they move, make them stand up straight, reposition their scapula, reposition their humeral head, and see if that relieves. Now, I don't clinically practice full-time anymore, but I do get some complicated cases. I had a lady who had had shoulder pain for three years, about a month and a half ago that I got seen. And as soon as I repositioned her scapula and stabilized her humerus, she could go from 90 degrees to 180 degrees, not 180, 160 degrees with a lot less pain. And so it's just a matter of using biomechanics and applying. So I really think if they have pain, painful arc, and I can reposition their spine or scapula, then I think that's part of my intervention approach as opposed to, oh, this is a acute shoulder dislocation or a traumatic fracture or something like that. So do I worry about somebody postoperatively having scapular dyskinesis? No, I don't because they're stiff. So the stiffness is the priority. Then, but I think any patient that is non-surgical, non, you know, um, not an obvious diagnosis, like a clavicle fracture, I'm going to at least investigate the scapula as a potential cause of what is going on and treat that in association with tightness in their glenohumeral joint and weakness and, and other interventions. Thanks. That's good to know. I've been thinking about, you know, what does it look like at rest? What does it look like during movement? Like you say, under load. And so really thinking about an observation and then thinking about the repositioning as a next step. Do you pay any attention to position at rest versus position during movement? Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, about yeah no, I do. But I, but I do think we know the body is asymmetrical. So watching and looking at somebody with rest and just saying, oh, I see your scapula winging. Well, they could have a little bit of subtle scoliosis. They could have a kyphotic spine. So I don't get freaked out. I don't overemphasize resting position. I make note of it. I watch how they move. I watch for symmetry. And then what kind of symptoms do they have? And can I modify that um, as the repositioning idea or adjusting, you know, trying to get the, the body to move? So if I understand the biomechanics, a scapula should upwardly rotate somewhere around 50 degrees as they go through full elevation. It should posturally tilt. Can I facilitate that a little bit? I think what happens, and I've had this happen a lot of times is PTs will say, oh, you got to really pinch your shoulder blade back. Well, you do when your arm is at your side, but to get your arm overhead, you can't keep your scapula retracted. And the scapula has to internally rotate as you lift your arms forward. Now, if you're in pure abduction, yeah, it externally rotates and it, and it posturally tilts, but about 90 degrees, it's got to move. 
So in the scapular plane, there is not squeeze that shoulder blade as far as you can. So below 90 degrees, you can work on retraction. And if somebody is really anteriorly tilted, that's probably something that's going to help them. So static posture helps, but it's not the end all be all if you don't take into consideration the spine, the ribs, um, a leg length discrepancy if they're standing. There's all kinds of things that you, you have to look at the whole person. I, I think a lot of people think all I do is look at scapulas, and I really don't. I do look <laughs> at the scapula, but I look at the whole body. I'm a pretty short guy. I'm only four foot ten. And so I look at hips mainly because that's my <laughs> eye. And then I work my way up. But but at the same time, I think as an older physical therapist, my concern for the younger physical therapist is everybody wants to fix one thing or focus on the ACL or ankle instability. You got to treat a person. You got to treat them mentally. You got to treat them physically. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of times fixing a shoulder is simply teaching them good core mechanics. <laughs> and it's not just about the scapula. I think one of the misconceptions about the diagnosis of scapular dyskinesis is that it is a diagnosis. And that's not true. We've written that. We've preached that a lot. It is an impairment. It is no different than having an overpronated foot. There are hundreds or thousands or millions of people walking around with overpronated feet and have no symptoms. Now, there are people that have pronated feet and have symptoms and feel way better when you correct the arch. That's scapular dyskinesis, right? There's a lot of people walking around probably with scapular dyskinesis that have no symptoms, no pain. And so just because I see a funny position scapula and when they lift their arms, it moves a little weird and they have no symptoms, that is to me is not scapular dyskinesis. That is just how they move. I wish I could make the ball go as far as Tiger Woods at his peak. I can't move like that. I'm not that gifted. So let me understand, because I think the pronated foot is a really good analogy, isn't it? But people can have an abnormally functioning scapula, you know, like it can move differently. Let's call that dyskinesis. And it okay. may or may not be part of their pain. Right. Or they can have it and not have the pain because people like you see them, don't you, presenting some of my patients on their on their unaffected side have the dyskinesis and not part of their pain. But when do you think it's relevant? Because I think that's the thing that's kind of tripping us up moving forward in this space. We see research that said this patient has shoulder pain. And when I look at their scapula, it doesn't help. But for some of those people, the scapular dysfunction is part of their presentation, is my belief. Who are they? How do we, how do we tell? So we, we know that some people who are normal, healthy, with unaffected shoulders, have scapular dyskinesis. How do we tell that it's involved in the patient's presentation? That's really the guts of what I wanted to ask you. How do right. we know? So, so I think in... In the position as physical therapist providers as rehabilitation, so somebody is injured, it has to be pain-provoking symptoms when they lift their arm and that I can change that or address that or modify that. I see it and I can alter it and they feel better. That's the patients that have pathophysiological scapula dysfunction. If they have full range of motion and no pain, great, probably not going to see me. I think where people get into trouble is prospectively, let's take a bunch of pictures and evaluate their scapula. Well, they're going to get hurt because they throw a lot of baseballs or they throw a lot of, they hit a lot of swings in volleyball or they swim a lot. Let's see if we can predict who's going to get hurt. Eh. Now you're different. That's a different issue. But as a clinician treating a painful shoulder, when I watch them and they move and they move really symmetrical, 
and I don't change their symptoms by repositioning their scapula, yet yeah, it still hurts. It's not as big a deal or it's not as the main focus of my rehab if I can't reposition them and make their symptoms get better or worse. Now, there's more than one way to move a scapula. So just posteriorly tilting them, like Dr. Kibler talks about with his scapular assistance, is one way. And internally rotating for a posterior instability shoulder, that helps them. I've had a dental student who had posterior shoulder instability. She got all this scapular assessment nobody could figure out. And everybody kept pinching her back, pinching her back, pinching her back. Do your scapular retraction. Up, Squeeze it into your pockets. That's the terminology. I internally rotated her, had her do her forward flexion. She could lift the weight she needed to lift. She was like, oh, that's much better. So every patient needs different movement patterns. So it's not always retraction. In her case, she had she was gliding out the back, as we've talked about with shoulder instabilities. So she was trying to retract her scapula all day, and her, her posterior capsule was getting overloaded. She needed to roll forward so she could lift her arms and bring the glenoid face more anteriorly. So now she had bone on bone. And so, Do you so think yeah, because yeah. I so what I've been bothered by is then because I hear you, we we know this about the dyskinesis. So yeah, okay, so I'm planting that. But then that lately there's been some research that talks about the lack of reliability between you know scapular assistance, scapular resistance. Can I change your pain with resisted movements? I'm bothered by the lack of reliability. But what you're saying, it's patient specific. Is that yes. would you ex? And is that, do you have any tips for clinicians then to help improve their reliability? Or Well, I, I think clinicians' reliability is individualized. So when you're talking about reliability testing, you know, it's usually in a rater. So, so yeah. I think don't just think one position. So the, the big tip I would take home point for the therapist is try different positions. Don't just retract. Upwardly yeah. rotate, posteriorly tilt, anteriorly tilt, internally rotate, downwardly rotate. Not a common thing that I see anterior, more anterior tilt and internal and downward rotation helping, but it might help somebody. I think upward rotation is important. I think posterior tilt for overhead activities. But when somebody has an underlying Ehler Danlos or instability, maybe they need more axial load. Maybe they need more humeral compression because their collagen and their hypermobility is an issue. So, so there is not one set way to move a scapula. The most common way for rotator cuff tendinopathy is to facilitate upward rotation and posterior tilt in forward in scapular plane motion. It's not the only way. And so you got to be a little bit of a Sherlock Holmes and, and try mm -hmm. a couple of different things. There's mm -hmm. not just one test to diagnose the, the a superior labral tear. There's not just, you know, we have to think of a battery and, and not, and take some time to figure out what's going to help that patient. Now I've seen patients who have progressed and they don't need as much stability I've rehabbed several patients where I'm doing a lot of the physical motor control movement with them for the first couple of weeks because they don't have the proprioceptive input, back to my dissertation. Um, but, but at the same time, trying to facilitate to teach them how to move as they're going through uh, those motions. And when they start to feel, that feels normal, that feels right, that feels natural. That feels easier. Those are terms that tell me I'm on the right path. Okay. So my final question around while we're talking about assessment diagnosis 
is um, around trying to look, like look further into that. Do you differentiate then between motor control or muscle strength? We know from some of the work that Gisela Soul has done here with Craig Wassinger when they injected like into and made a painful shoulder, then the scapular mechanics change. So do you have any tips for clinicians, motor control versus strength? Do you think about them as components separately? What, what are your thoughts? Yes, I do think of them as separate components. Motor control is always first and foremost in my mind. Strengthening comes more often second. Um, if they don't know how to move their scapula or reposition um, the scapula voluntarily, which is a motor control pattern in my mind. So the term motor control means everything and anything to everybody. So, so <laughs> in my mind, being able to put the arm or put the components of the arm in the right position is motor control. So I want to be able to turn on the correct muscles, have enough mobility. You know, sometimes you have to start with simple stretches before you can even do motor control because they're so bound up or massage or manual therapy if they're, if that's called for. So getting them the ability to move is sort of job one sometimes, especially post-operatively. And then Motor control is actively assisting them feeling that right motion. To me, strengthening or endurance training now is changing. I have the movement pattern. Now I'm going to build it to the needs of that individual. Are they a manual laborer? They need some power and some endurance to work eight hours a day. Are they a swimmer or are they a, a pitcher or a tennis player? who's going to do explosive work. So, so there's different components. It's rare in shoulders. You need absolute power. There's exceptions, wrestlers, javelin throwers, discus throwers, but that's a pretty small population. The majority of the people work with their arms at shoulder and a little bit overhead, tennis players, baseball players, volleyball players, and it's more endurance. So when you say strengthening, I'm going to put strength and endurance in the same wheelhouse that some people may need more, more load, but more often than not, they need reps, lightweight, not hundreds of pounds, maybe five pounds at the max, two, three pound reps, or excuse me, in kilograms, <laughs> one and two kilogram loads, right? Uh, sorry, I'm just an American. Um, but but trying to be respectful of my international colleagues um, to to try to think about these as moderate but high repetition. So so strength and or endurance comes secondary to motor control. Movement ability to move comes first, then motor control. So if they don't have the motion, tight muscle immobilization, I'm having to work on that. Now, that doesn't mean I can't do anything while they're immobilized. We do a lot of rehabilitation stuff, or at least I did when I was practicing more clinically, in a sling where they're moving their trunk, moving their scapula, moving their cervical spine, even though their shoulder is recovering two or three or four days after surgery. So we're still training the whole body. And the kinetic chain concept is when you throw a ball, is you don't throw a ball just with your shoulder and your scapula. You start with your feet and you drive off the ground, the ground reaction forces, and all the way up through the kinetic chain. So tennis, baseball, softball, all of those Americanized sports, but, but certainly volleyball and tennis is played around the world. Um, but any kind of power move, discus, javelin, we have the Olympics going on right now. We're not quite to track and field. We're all in the um, the swimming world right now, but um, you know you can appreciate it's a whole body activity. So we really try to train the whole body throughout the rehabilitation. Some people, non-athletes, struggle with that. So they need very isolated, specific activities sometimes, much easier for them. Um, they're not quite as coordinated. Okay. Did okay. I go all over the place? I'm sorry. Yeah, you did, but I was following you. It was wonderful. It's wonderful. So I wanted but, but just to stretch stretching, motor control, strengthening. I do separate that. And it's just, do they have the ability to move correctly? 
if they can't move correctly, there's no need for me to add weight. Yeah. So what I wanted to do, Tim, was just wrap up the session on assessment of scapula and think, do you have, and we can, we'll can, we'll have a separate podcast, I think, around the treatment and how you address scapular dysfunction, but do you have any closing remarks around um, how clinicians should be assessing and, and diagnosing? One of the things that I've learned from you this morning is around being really patient-specific around scapular positioning with some of, the, some of these tests. Do you have any other... Uh, little clinical gems that you'd like to share with clinicians around scapular assessment? Yep. So it's been great to to talk to you about all of this. So I've watched you um, evaluate one of my uh, students a couple years ago. So I know you're very good at that. It is hard. It takes some time. And we did that via telehealth. But the um, the the gym would be take their shirt off appropriately <laughs> yeah. and look at them from behind. That's job one. You've got to watch it move during active motion. Job two, if you see that they're moving funny, significantly funny, not a little, you know, when we teach, I teach entry level students. So they are all looking at each other that it's not perfectly symmetrical. They're like, is this something? I'm like, do they have any pain? They see maybe a little bit of stuttering as they go up. Um, you can overanalyze that. But do they have significant scapular dysfunction with symptoms? Those are two cornerstones. If that's the case, then you need to get your hands involved and start repositioning scapulas, repositioning their spine, and seeing if you can change. The key, I think, is no different than the classic spurling test. So what a spurling test does is it positions the neck to close down on the intervertebral foramen. If you get referred pain down your arm, not in your neck, down your arm, that's indicative of a radiculopathy. It doesn't tell you where the radiculopathy is, right? Could be C5 through T1, but you're headed down that road. So if you do those couple of things, it doesn't tell you if they have a tight pec. It doesn't tell you if they have weak lower trap, bad serratus, bad cuff. What, where is the dyskinetic patterning coming from? Those sort of help you uh, going down that road. You then have to dig deeper. I think people want the quick fix. Oh, do a scapular assistance test. Do a scapular retraction position. Yep, their symptoms got better. Give them scapula exercises. Which ones? Well, there's only 10,000. Um, so so you got to be a little <laughs> bit more um, Sherlocky to try to focus on that. We'll talk about where what I start with here in a few minutes, I guess. Yeah, that, that would be great. I know, um, just to wrap up, I know that you have uh, put together some videos too. Do you just want to tell the listeners about the videos that, that you have? Yeah, so Dr. Kibler retired a couple of years ago. He and I stay very, um, very close and communicate. And um, so I had the idea uh, of trying to capture some of this stuff on video. So we tried to um, create a little video company um, and market some videos. That didn't go out, go so well. But Dr. Kibler really wants us to share this information. I want to share this information so we have taken those videos and put them online through YouTube for free uh, for individuals to share this knowledge. And Dr. Kibler's lectured all over the world. Um, I haven't gotten to go quite as many places as him, but I've gotten to go to New Zealand and other places to share some of this knowledge. So we've set up a website um, on YouTube for people to watch some of these videos. So we have one on scapular assessment. Um, we have uh, two roundtable discussions. We have one with this really cool scapula model that Dr. Kibler had built and sort of looking at how different uh, muscles are sort of pulling and tugging. These are, it's a homemade wooden model 
and then it has little ropes that we pull on. And there's like three orthopedic surgeons, two PhDs sitting around on a Saturday afternoon talking over each other. Not too much, um, but but some discussing that. And then Dr. Kibler put a couple of his uh, lectures about scapular function on this website to share with the world um, wherever anybody would want to go get that. So I've given that to Margie, Dr. Olds, to um, uh, post on her web page. And it's I just made it public here the last week or so. Yeah, that's great, Jim. And I can put this in the links from um, today. So, yeah, thanks again for your time. Um, and we'll chat shortly about uh, scapular treatment and how you address this, this dysfunction. Very good. Look forward to it. <laughs>Thanks for joining us for today's podcast. I hope you've really enjoyed this content. You found some clinically useful tidbits and some of the content has been thought provoking. If you have other ideas for content for these podcasts, then please reach out to me on social media via Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. I'm happy to get your feedback about the, the content and if we can improve that in any way or talk to researchers or clinicians who you would like, then I'm happy to do so. Don't forget you can follow me on my social media for some more up-to-date content. You can also access me for patient-specific help. If you'd like to do that, then I also offer that service via Telehealth Worldwide. If you're looking for a shoulder brace, you can check that out via our shoulder braces on flawlessmotion.com. And if you wanted an online shoulder course, then I have a range of shoulder courses, through from an introductory shoulder course, through to return to sport and a shoulder instability course. The instability course was designed to accompany the clinical concepts paper that we published in the Journal of Athletic Training. You can access these courses on margieolds.com or flawlessmotion.com. That's F-L-A-W-L-E-S-S-M-O-T-I-O-N.com. And every course comes with a complimentary question and answer session so we can drill into your understanding of the key concepts of the course. You can also join our Facebook group, Gleno Humoral Gurus, and follow along for the conversations and discussions on this page. And otherwise, I look forward to you joining us for the next podcast. Thanks for your time. Until then, stay well. Take care.